Buenos días, Iguay. Good morning, Iguay. Hola, soy Emanuel Almeida y soy de la República Dominicana. I am Emanuel Almeida and I come from the Dominican Republic. Gracias. Thank you. Eh, vengo de parte del grupo de programa. I'm here representing the program team. Y les damos la gracia por prestar su, su atención hacia las plenarias. And we want to thank you for paying attention to all the plenaries. Y hoy que hay una plenaria, les exhorto a que le ponga suma atención. And today, when we have a plenary, I really invite you to pay your utmost attention. Ahora les presento a Avery. Here I'm introducing Avery. Hello, uh, I am Avery, and I'm from the Diocese of Massachusetts. Uh, um, and I'm on the program team, and I have the honor today of introducing Josh Thomas. Fifteen years ago, during a time of intense violence in the holy city of Jerusalem, a group of 12 Jewish, Christian, and Muslim parents came together to create a place where children from all religions and both sides of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict could find a path to peace. It wasn't easy. Hatred, fear, and injustice had erupted into a bloody conflict that was tearing their community apart. But these pe parents were people of faith, and the religions called them to make peace. They dreamed of a better future for their own children and for the city of Jerusalem that they all called home. One of those parents when Suhail Dawani, now the Archbishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem, together with a team at St. George's Cathedral and College, these parents created a new program they called Kids for Peace. Kids for Peace, when it just began, was 12 children. Today, Kids for Peace has grown into a global movement with more than 1,000 active youth and educators in Jerusalem and cities across the United States. Kids for Peace youth are building bridges of understanding between religions and raising their voices for peace and justice in a deeply divided world. And they're here today to share with us their path to peace. We are proud to welcome Father Josh Thomas, an Episcopal priest and executive director of Kids for Peace International, along with youth leaders Charlie and Adam from Jerusalem, and Lana from Vermont. Good morning, EYE. Good morning. When I was a junior in college in the great granite state of New Hampshire, I went on a trip that changed my life. A professor invited me to come with him to Bosnia-Herzegovina a small country in Europe about the size of South Carolina, where a brutal war between religious and ethnic groups had been waged in the 1990s. We were there to do psychology research, to study the impact of long-term violence on the growth and development of youth. But something else happened to me on that trip, a religious awakening. You see, in Bosnia, more than 100,000 people died in that war. Most of them were Muslim. Most were killed by Christians. It made no sense to me. How could people who say they follow Jesus, the one who taught, blessed are the peacemakers, love your enemy? How could people from my own faith unleash such evil on others? And so from that day, I dedicated my life and my vocation to the path of peace. I wanted to do my part as a leader in this Jesus movement, to use the power of religion as a force for good and not as a weapon of hate or division or violence. Today, I walk my path to peace with sisters and brothers from many different religions as part of a movement called Kids for Peace. 
As Avery said, Kids for Peace started in the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem as a small program to help 12 Jewish, Christian, and Muslim kids find their path to peace. Today, Kids for Peace has grown into a global community of more than 1,000 youth and educators in Jerusalem and across the USA. And a lot of that is thanks to Episcopalians, some of whom are in this room today. I know that Malcolm from Kids for Peace Seattle is here. And I know that Morgan from Kids for Peace Vermont is here. And Mackenzie from Kids for Peace Atlanta is here today. And special thanks to those bishops who helped bring Kids for Peace to their diocese, to Neil Alexander from Atlanta, Michael Curry when he was Bishop of North Carolina, uh, and Tom Ely from the Diocese of Vermont. Today, Kids for Peace organizes after-school programs, overnight retreats, and summer camps where youth from different backgrounds come together to learn about each other's religions and cultures, to break down walls of hatred and fear, and to learn skills to be leaders who bring peace to their communities. This morning, I have the great honor to introduce to you three of those leaders, Adam and Charlie from Jerusalem, and Lana from Vermont. They have grown up in Kids for Peace, and today they share their stories with you. First, let's give a big Episcopal welcome to Adam from Jerusalem. Hey, my name is Adam, and I'm 16. I have three siblings, I'm Jewish, and I live in Jerusalem. Let me tell you a bit about my family history. The families of my great-grandparents from all sides were born in Poland and the Ukraine. Life for the Jews in these countries was difficult. It was not uncommon for Jews to be attacked and killed, sometimes entire families. My great-grandfather came to Israel shortly after his own father was shot at his doorstep with the family looking on just because he was a Jew. My great-grandfather was a Zionist. He believed life would be normal for the Jews if they had autonomy in their own state, in Zion, the place that for centuries they have launched for. He wanted to be part of creating this Jewish home. He used to tell my father, his grandson, that the family arrived to Russia after being expelled from Spain in 1492. He did not want his family to face persecution. In fact, his relatives and those who have on my grandmother's side who stayed in Europe were murdered just a few decades later on European soil. Living in Israel as a Jew is amazing. For 2,000 years, the Jewish people wished to get back to their homeland. I am privileged to be part of it now after my ancestors prayed toward Jerusalem and dreamed about it for centuries. It is very special for me to observe the practice of Judaism in the land of, my, uh, in the land of Israel, things like reading from the Torah, keeping the Sabbath, wearing tefillin when we pray, and celebrating holidays like Hanukkah, Passover, and Sukkot, all, all in the ancient homeland of my people. From the time I was a small boy, I heard a lot about Palestinians, but I usually only heard about them in relation to terror, stone throwing, or rocket shooting. I never met any actual Palestinian people. My only interaction with Palestinians was passing them by on the street or, for example, riding a bus with a Palestinian driver. There was no natural way to stop and talk to them. Very early on, I got scared walking alone in the Palestinian areas, and I was afraid to be the only passenger in a bus with a Palestinian driver. But in the other, one, in the other hand, I was confused. None of the Palestinians I met in the street looked harmful, and some of them even smiled to me. I didn't know who to believe, the media, or what I saw in the street, or maybe something in the middle. That is why I was very excited and curious when my mother told me one day, in the middle of sixth grade, that, that I got the opportunity to be interviewed for a, stop, for a spot in Kids for Peace, just like my sister. Joining the program and would give me a chance to have Palestinian friends, even though none of my Jewish friends did. My grandfather, who was part of the founding of Israel, always dreamt of peace. It was his fate to fight in the War of Independence where he lost many friends. But he also saw the human face of the enemy. Let me tell you a story about my grandfather. During the holiday of Hanukkah in 1949, my grandfather was stationed on the Gaza border. Early one morning, the, Egy the Egyptians fled, leaving their dead and wounded in the field. He went out on, round and on rounds and suddenly he heard the choked voice gasping, water, water in English. He saw an enormous Sudanese soldier. The soldier was badly wounded. My grandfather gave him water and took him to the place where the prisoners were being held. On the way, my grandfather noticed he was holding a child's wrist stained with blood. 
He asked him about it, and the soldier said, I bought it in Gaza from a little girl. When he was walking home from the prisoner's camp, my grandfather noticed the dress on the ground. He realized it had fallen from the soldier's, he realized it had fallen from the soldier's hand. He ran back to look for him, but he couldn't find him. My grandfather kept the dress at home for many years, hoping to return it when peace came. My grandfather was called up again in the Six Day War in 1967, still dreamt of peace. He is a proud Zionist, but he believes that ruling in the Palestinian territories forces Israel to do things that he cannot ethically support, but that will tragically continue until peace is achieved. My grandfather is a humanist, and he raised me to be one too. I believe there is, there is many people like this on both sides. My grandfather always tells me he is not sure he will get to see peace, but he is sure I will. I knew that going to Kids for Peace and making a step towards peace would make all my grandparents happy and proud. My other grandfather is, uh, was active in Jewish, Christian, and Jewish African American relations in the 1970s in Philadelphia. He is also a humanist and peace seeker. Joining Kids for Peace was a way for me to follow their footsteps and seek a path to peace my, for myself. When I went to my first Kids for Peace meeting, I knew I was going to have a great time. I met amazing people, both youth and counselor, and I understood for the very first time that not all Palestinians throw stone or blow up buses. In sixth grade, our Kids for Peace group began meeting every other week, and we got to know each other and grew closer. That summer, we went to camp, where we learned about each other's religions and cultures and became good friends. Seventh grade started out great, but quickly became incredibly challenging. That summer, the summer of 2014, a military operation started in Gaza. It was a very challenging time for both sides. On the Israeli side, what happened was that hundreds of rockets were shot from Gaza to Israel every day. It was very hard to keep living normally that summer. A lot of events were canceled, and my, scam and my scout camp was evacuated. Many of my neighbors, family, and family friends were called up to the army. Two 19 years old from my neighborhood were killed. In that period of war and tension in the streets, it was very difficult to talk to Palestinians. I was very, very mad at, my, at the Palestinian people. My understanding was that a lot of the Palestinians were killed because Hamas was using them as a human shield. I couldn't understand the Palestinian side. What I saw was the Palestinians shooting rockets on Jewish and Arab civilians in Israel, and Israel defending itself. Going to Kids for Peace meetings that summer was a life-changing experience. I met Charlie, whom I, had, whom I hadn't known before, as well as many other Christian and Muslim Palestinians. I listened to their perspectives, to their stories. Meeting with my new friends and kids for peace, I heard about their families or friends in Gaza who were killed or who were stuck there and could not get help. They were separated from their loved ones and in great danger. Listening to them made me understand that this story has two sides. It's not only us suffering. Without knowing the other side personally and without understanding their problems, we cannot achieve peace. In eighth grade, we continued meeting twice monthly, and we also had several seminars where we continued the process we had begun in seventh grade. Our focus border broadened from emphasis on our religions to an emphasis on our nationalities. The shift forced us to talk. Uh, the, the shift forced us to talk about hard and complicated stuff, but it was much easier to discuss it then because we already knew each other. We were friends. In ninth grade, last year, we continued those hard conversations. But something changed last summer when we went to, go to a Kids for Peace program called the Global Institute in Washington, D.C. At first, we thought it would be just like our other camps, just having fun and hanging out with friends. When we got there and saw the schedule, we were shocked. We were, all, we were going to learn about democracy and civil society and how the U.S. government works. The schedule was packed with so many serious meetings every day. There were almost no breaks. At the beginning, some of us were disappointed, but after a day or two, we all understood we would have the, that is going to be the most significant camp we ever had at Kid for Peace. We met with staff at the State Department, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, the White House, USAID, and the United States Institute for Peace. We had meetings with, congress with congressional staff on Capitol Hill talking about legislation that would directly impact our lives in Jerusalem. We had so many great experiences, and that was also where I got to know Lana, which is right here. One of the most powerful experiences I had in Kids for Peace happened that summer at the Global Institute. We were about 12 boys, and we slept at a big room at the youth hostel. One night, I don't really remember how we got to talk about it, but we talked about the end of the world. Then we read on, we read on the internet that the end of the world, uh, like we read about the end of the world in each of the three monotheistic religions. 
So we saw that each religion has its own version of what is going to happen, but they all shared one common element. They seemed like they're going to happen soon and that the signs are all, had already come. Then we made, a circle, we made a circle, and each boy, in his turn, prayed to God. Those who didn't believe in God played a song they liked, they liked on YouTube, and we all listened. Praying with these 11, praying with these 11, 11 other boys, Jew, Jews, Christians, and Muslim by faith, Israeli, Palestinian, and American by nationality, each saying amen when we heard the other pray to God, I understood, I found my pathway to peace. This year, some of us became counselors, and we are working to help the younger kids have the same amazing experience we have had. We also talk to groups from all over the world that come to Jerusalem, telling our personal stories and sharing more about Kids for Peace. We have seen how Kids for Peace has real impact on our own lives. Teach teaching peace in our sign to the next generation of kids in Jerusalem. Teaching tourists, mostly Jews and Christians from America, about the complex reality of Jerusalem and the conflict, and providing hope and optimism in difficult days. When we tell our stories and how we found our pathway to peace, it affects those around us and makes them believe that peace is possible. They understand they can also find their own pathway to peace. And that is where it all starts. To this day, our Israel and Palestinian political leaders think that all they need to do is sit in a room and sign a peace treaty. Last time they tried it, it ended up with a lot of terror from the Palestinian side in an attempt to make the peace agreement fail. There was also great resistance to the agreement on the Israeli side, including the assassination of Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin, the, the leader who was spearheading the agreement. He was killed by an Israeli Jew who did not agree with the, to this treaty. The problem was that the leaders did not understand. They did not understand one important thing. In order to find pathway to peace between nations, there needs to be peace between the people. Because if Israel and Palestinians continue walking past each other on the street and not talk to each other and not get to know each other, signing a peace agreement be between the leaders will never work. The people will still be filled with hate and fear and the agreement will fail. On the other hand, if each one of us will make the effort to meet the other and find their own pathway to peace, like we do in Kids for Peace, if we can see the humanity in both sides, if we can know their pain, their fear, their hopes, and their stories, then achieving peace will be possible. I would like to end with a prayer from, for peace from the Jewish tradition, first in English and then in Hebrew. God, who makes peace in the heavens, makes peace on us and on all Israel. And I add, on all the world, and let's say, Amen. Thank you. Now let's welcome Charlie. My name is Charlie Azar, and I have found my pathway to peace. I'm a 16-year-old Christian Palestinian living in Jerusalem. My family and I are part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in the Holy Land. I have five siblings, Carla, Lutfi, Carmen, Lucas, and Marco which is considered a lot here in the US. I live in a land full of conflict. As an ordinary young Palestinian boy, the thought of having an Israeli friend never crossed my mind. To go back in history, my great-grandfather was a fisherman in a coastal town in Palestine called Yaffa. Over the next generations, more and more Jews migrated to Palestine to seek a Jewish nation after the tragedies of the Holocaust. Eventually, the dispute over the land erupted into physical violence, and the Israelis won the conflict, therefore creating Israel. In 1948, however, the Israeli occupation forced my grandfather to give up his home and land in Yaffa and move to Jerusalem just because he was Arab. Today, I live in Jerusalem. Yet, my family is divided in half because of the Israeli occupation. My mother's family lives in the small town of Bethlehem. You may have heard of it. It's the same Bethlehem where Jesus was born. Today, it is cut in from Jerusalem by a separation wall. I live on one side, 
my mom's family lives on another. In order to go from one side of the wall to visit my family on the other side, I have to pass through extensive security checks by the Israeli army at a crossing called a checkpoint. This feels like going through airport security, but with more harassment and injustice. The only Israelis many Palestinians ever interact with are these soldiers at the checkpoints. On the other hand, many ordinary Israelis never get the chance to have a conversation with a Palestinian. The social, political, and physical barriers between the Palestinians and Israelis are huge obstacles between us and standing in the way of peace. We have different buses, different schools, different languages, different neighborhoods. We almost never meet each other. I still vividly remember the day when I, met my, when I made my first Israeli friend. It was back in 2012. I was 12 years old and I came to my interview to join Kids for Peace. During the interview, we had to do a small project with other kids, kids from both sides, Israelis and Palestinians. One of the Jewish Israeli kids in my group was named Aviv. As we worked on our project, we started talking about things we like. Aviv started talking about volleyball, and I started talking about soccer. We had many similarities. We both loved sports, traveling, and many other things. Eventually, we both got accepted into Kids for Peace, and I was excited to attend each meeting. That summer, I traveled with Kids for Peace to a camp in Atlanta. The meetings, activities, and workshop made the whole group grow closer and closer to each other. I started trusting my Israeli friends, like Aviv, after years and years of thinking every Israeli is like the soldier on the checkpoint, I met people